All right. So topic for today's lecture is um, node centrality metrics and link analysis. So this is probably one of the most well central topics for when you study networks. Um, and uh, it's dedicated to understanding how the position of the node in the network affects um, its, its abilities, its importance. So we're going to talk about centrality measures. And this is sort of quite old topic. Um, in fact, sociologists spend a lot of time figuring out, uh, you know, who is more important in the network, right? And uh, introduce a bunch of measures, and we're going to cover them. It's degree centrality, closest centrality, between the centrality, and a little bit more com complicated metric, which is called eigenvector centrality. And then we're going to switch uh, and talk about ranking on the directed graphs. And we talk about the metrics that have been introduced by um, Google, well, back then PageRank metric, and another metric which is called HITS. Um, these are very, very powerful metrics and used a lot in practice these days to rank nodes um, on, on the graph or on the network. Um, and so the first sort of the first bullet, the centrality measures, they typically apply for undirected networks. Um, the, the second bullet, which is it says ranking on directed graphs, we all understand that any undirected graph can be thought of as a directed graph which on every edge you just have both directions, right? So the second, again, bullet is much more um, general. Okay, so if you look at this picture, um, so what you see here is that the, the nodes, um, you know, some of the nodes, the way they're shown, um, the, the size of the node is proportional to the number of uh, directed neighbors, right? The direct connections or neighbors of this node. Um, and then they're located a certain way. So by looking at this picture, which nodes do you think, which nodes or vertices do you think are important? The, the white ones, I suppose. So the, 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 the white one uh, and why, why, why the white ones? Uh, the white um, vertices are quite important because they're the biggest here in the picture. Okay, uh, well, that's, that's logic, right? That's one way to think about this. Um, I, honestly, I think uh, it's important here to ask me a question, uh, you know, important in what sense, right? Because, um, you know, I'm saying important, but I'm not explaining what I mean by importance, right? And, and so pretty much the next uh, several slides, next half an hour, we'll be talking about various ways, you know, the nodes can be important. Um, and obviously you can think about the importance of the node as, for example, the number of connections, if you think about social network, and it is, you know, a number of, let's say, followers for a person, if it's immediate person, right, the number of followers. But at the same time, we know that uh, people talk about all kind of viral effects where um, the information is spread not only spread not only to, from um, the person to its direct neighbors, direct connections, but also propagates out into the network. So if you think about it that way, um, you might rethink the, the notion of importance. You know, maybe this person is connected to, to three people and his kind of degree is only three because he has only three direct neighbors. But each of those neighbors connected to a lot of people. And so in two steps, um, his message can reach a um, much, much wider audience, right? So, you know, maybe then he's also important. Or you can think about very, very different scenario, um, like corporate scenario, where there are different parts of the corporations and people interact with each other. Um, over there, you know, would, would the person with most of the connection be, you know, very important? Could be, but, um, you know, if you think about how corporations work, um, there are some people who are more egregious, right? And they also become important because the messages from one part of the corporation to another will go through that bridge, right? And being sort of a messenger can be a very, very sweet position, right? And so you can think about a lot of different scenarios or, you know, another way to think about this, think about, you know, subway station, think about Moscow 
subway map, which station would be the most central in, 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 in the subway? Oh, come on. There are some stations on the, on the ring, I suppose. On the Is ring uh, line. Yeah, so they, may, maybe on the, on, the, on the ring, or maybe, you know, Ploshit, Ploshit, Revolutsi, Teatralne. So maybe those, because they're kind of look, they're in the geometric center. So you can think about sort of different metrics. If, if, you, if, if the importance and centrality of the station is defined as uh, how is, is defined to the time it takes to get from that station to any other station, then those guys that, that, that the most sort of geometrically centered could be important. So depending on how we define importance, uh, different nodes can be the most important. And so we can literally rank nodes by importance in, a very, in, 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 in many different ways. And um, the way we rank them depends on our definition of what important is, what, what's important is. Now, um, there is this interesting story um, about centrality measures. Now, if you look at this slide, at this diagram, there is one name here that I'm sure you're familiar with. Okay, which, what, 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 what name? looks more familiar than others. Medici. Well, Medici, right? So we, we somehow remember about Medici. Um, this is uh, 15th century Florentines families. And uh, what's known from the history that Medici actually were not the richest, were not the most powerful at some moments. So it was a big, you know, big, big, big question. Why, um, why after, you know, five centuries, we still know about them and not about um, the other families. And you know, one of the hypotheses is that they did a very, very smart marriage alliances uh, and positioned themselves very um, nicely within the network, such that they became extremely important for the society. And so the hypothesis is that that's why, after all those centuries, we still remember them because they managed to strategically place themselves within the society in such a way that, um, you know, after centuries, they remember. We're going to look back into the slide at the very end um, after we learn um, different metrics. Excuse me, what the ages of with uh, graph mean? Well, the ages is uh, marriage alliances. So it's, it's, it's a married. So they, they've been, you know, members of that family married to the members of the other family. Okay, so if you look at those three graphs, um, you know, it really doesn't matter what kind of centrality metrics we come up with. Um, there are certain things, there's certain properties that those centrality metrics should obey, right? So if you look, for example, at the star, at the star graph, uh, which node you know, should be the most central here? Node A? Of course, A, right? I mean, obvious. What can we say about the centrality, whatever centrality we come up with, about the centrality of D, E, C, B of those nodes? No, it looks to be equal. Yeah, they should, it should be the same, right? Because uh, they are in equal positions with respect to each other and the node A. So they, you know, they should be equivalent. Now, if we look at the circle graph at the wheel, um, what can you say about, I mean, whatever centrality metric we come up, comes up with, we, we come up with, um, what can you say about centrality of all those nodes? It's all the same it for every node. Same, right, it should be the same. And if you look at the line graph, you could probably assume that the centrality, you know, in this case, again, whatever centrality metric we come up with, centrality of the nodes probably D, C should be higher than the centrality of the nodes, say G and A, right? And probably also due to the symmetry, you know, you'd expect say, you know, G and A have the same centrality or single centrality. So uh, why I'm showing this, this pictures is because um, they're actually very, very good testing graphs. When you start building algorithms for centrality or using algorithms, um, it's, it's worthwhile to actually take those, you know, simple graphs and run your algorithms on these graphs, right? Such that, you know, you, you will get, when you get the results, um, they should make sense, right? And here what makes sense 
is the highest centrality for node A, for example, in the star, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, uh, the star arrangement is a sort of the most unequal arrangements you can think of um, when you have uh, n nodes um, having you know one node connected to everybody creates the largest sort of unequal inequality. Okay. So the first centrality metric we're going to talk about is the simplest one. It's a degree centrality. This is just really just the number of nearest neighbors, right? Nothing else. And uh, you can think about this as, uh, you know, if you, if you think about graph through the matrix representation um, and for undirected graph, the matrix is symmetric. And if it's a binary matrix, it's just the sum of the elements of the matrix in the row or in the column. Now, quite often, you might want to talk about normalized centrality, right? So there is this degree centrality, and then there is this normalized centrality. Now, we normalize it if there are n nodes in the graph, uh, we divide it by n minus 1, right? Why do we divide by n minus 1? Okay, so let's let's start. Actually, let's start from the other thing. Why do we want nor to normalize something? What's the point? We want to compare graphs. Uh, we have different sizes. Exactly you're right. So if we have a, if you want only to compare nodes within the same graph, it really does matter. You know, you don't need to normalize things. But if you want to compare positions of the nodes, importance of the nodes in between different graphs of different sizes, right? One graph of the size five, another graph of the size 5,000, right? You take a node and it has here five neighbors and you take a node that has their five neighbors. Well, look, if you only have five nodes overall and somebody, ha well, you have six nodes overall and somebody has five neighbors, this is probably the most central node. If you have 5,000 nodes and somebody has five neighbors, well, most likely it's not the most sort of central in terms of the degree, right? So that's the reason you want to normalize. Now, why do we normalize? Why do we divide it by n minus one and not by n? Uh, because we count the centrality for one node, so we don't need to count it. So we count it with the n minus one. No, all, almost there, uh, because the highest, if you have n nodes, the largest possible degree centrality for any node in any arrangement will be n minus one, right? You know, the, the, the largest possible centrality would be if the node is connected to everybody. And if there are n nodes, it's gonna be n minus one nodes, right? So that's, that's the explanation. You will see this normalization a lot through the rest of the lecture, but that's why we normalize. So again, high centrality degree, it's a direct contact with other nodes or, you know, direct friends. And if you notice, yeah, the picture here, it actually shows you this, the, the blue and the pink nodes. And though the blue node is much more sort of central in terms of its positioning in the graph, right? Those that are pink nodes have high degree centrality. So if you think about degree centrality, um, you just really measure just the number of direct connections. Doesn't matter where in the graph the node is. All right. No questions here. Um, the second metric that is interesting is called closeness centrality. So closeness centrality, it's the distance from, uh, it measures the distance from the node to other nodes in the graph. Well, in fact, it measures the inverse of it, right? So the idea is that the most central nodes is located such a way that it is the closest to all the nodes in the graph. So you take a node and you measure a distance from this node to every other node in the graph. You add them up, you add up those distances. And then you take, uh, then you rank the nodes in inverse. So the one that, that has, uh, the, the one that has the sum the smallest, right? Um, that has the largest centrality. So because it is the closest to everybody, right? This is where the, you know, the Plosche Trivaluzzi, you know, the, the Teatralne, 
will will have the highest uh, metric, the highest closest centrality, because if you try to reach all the stations in the Moscow subway, most likely those guys will have the shorter path from the from them to each and every uh, station, right? The shortest sum. And uh, again, the path is defined as a number of steps um, along the graph from one node to another, right? Make sense? Okay. And normalization here is also towards n minus one, but here you actually need to multiply it. So, well, the, the reason is again, because the, the, the distance is in denominator. And um, this is the shortest communication. This is the shortest path. You can, you can think about this uh, from several angles. Again, one way to think about this as, uh, you know, as, as think about transportation networks and the distance, you know, like actual distance um, and positioning. The other way to think about this is if you think about social network and you think about, um, you know, how far people are from each other, uh, sort of how many steps you need to cover uh, for one person to meet to another person. So this is, uh, this is the answer, right? This centrality um, will, will, will pick up the person who is, uh, who is closest to all the people um, in your network. Now, the challenge with this metric, and uh, you need to be careful here, the challenge is that if you do have um, disconnected graphs, by whatever reason, you know, the graph that consists of two parts, um, then the distance in between those nodes that, that lives in those two parts will be infinity. And uh, you cannot uh, calculate this metric. So this metric works well for uh, a single component, right? Um, the, there are options to do what's called harmonic centrality, but you know you rarely see that. Okay, does this metric make sense? Okay, all right. Um, there is one more metric you can think of, and that metric is what's called betweenness centrality. And the idea is the following. Um, as I mentioned in the introduction, imagine, you know, the, the sort of corporate world scenario um, and there are people who interact with each other, people know each other. And then there is a, and let's say there are two groups of people, let's look at this, uh, the picture you see them again in red and blue, right? And for example, uh, you know, there is a person who connects those groups of people, right? Who knows both of the groups of people? So this person is a bridge, right? And uh, as a bridge, um, you know, the person carries certain importance. <clears throat> For example, if, you know, bridge is removed, um, the graph will fall apart, right? It also means that if you think about this as a communication network, um, every communication from the blue people will go to red people only through the yellow guy, right? or like orange guy, right, through node A. So he's important in this structure, right? And, but if you look at him, you know, the, the, the uh, degree centrality is low, it's only two, right? So only two nodes directly connected, so as a degree centrality will be low. And in terms of actually, uh, um, you know, the geometric centrality, right? It's also not gonna be hot, not, not, not gonna be the, 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 the top one. So, but all the shortest path goes through him. I mean, most, a lot of shortest path go through him, not all of course, but a lot of shortest path goes through, through the node. And so the idea of between the centrality is the following. For every node, you measure, you calculate all the shortest path that goes through that node, all right? For every node, and then, what you do is you also do normalization. And uh, I'll try to explain right now. Um, give, me, give me one second. I'll turn on, get the, um, the pencil. Okay, so for example, 
if we have this node and let's say this node, then the shortest path go through this guy, right? If I have this node and this node, this is the shortest path. If I take this node and this node, this is the shortest path. If I take this node and that node, okay, well, this is gonna be the shortest path, right? So what, I, what we can do is for every node, we count how many shortest paths go through this node. And the way formula operates is the following. You take the number of shortest path that goes in between two nodes, S and T, and that goes to node I. So this can be like this. Um, this is a node I. I want to calculate um, all the shortest path to go through. Um, and I go and I pick up different nodes S, which is a start node, and different node T, which is a finish node. And I go through all of them, calculate all the shortest path. So I calculate all the shortest path that goes from node S to node T and goes through node I. And then I normalize it by the total number of shortest paths that goes in between node S and T overall, not necessarily through node I. So in this case, in the case I showed here, all of them go through node I. And so pretty much this coefficient <clears throat> will be very large. Uh, sorry. Okay. Um, and we can also think about normalizing the centrality and the reason is exactly the same as um, on, on, on the previous um, centralities because we want to make sure um, that uh, we can compare centralities uh, of the nodes between different graphs. Now here normalization is a little bit more complicated but this factor n minus one uh, times n minus two divided by two um, that comes from the just number of total possible pairs um, when you have n nodes in the graph. So it's normalizing by all possible paths in between all the nodes. And what uh, do we do if there are two possible shortest paths? If what? If, if there are two possible shortest paths. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So let's say, um, let me do this. Right. So let's say we have this this scenario, and we want to calculate um, between the centrality for the node I, right? And this is node S, and this is node T. So there are two shortest paths of exactly the same length, right? One shortest path is um, let me change it. This is the one shortest path, and this is not the shortest path, right? So that's exactly what's explained um, here uh, because there are two shortest paths, there are, on, there, are all, there are two shortest paths, and then only one of them goes through the node I'm interested in. And so the contribution is one half instead of one. Make sense? Okay. And then you, of course, sum over all possible S and Ts. All right. Uh, now, the, the challenge with this um, approach, though it's very interesting it's, and it's quite powerful and often non-obvious um, metric, it's actually quite computationally, computationally intensive to compute because if you have N nodes um, and, and it's, you know, almost N squared pairs of nodes, so that's a lot and a lot of computations. And if the graph is large, it's usually just not possible to compute. So instead of doing that, what's typically done is um, it, this computation is done through random sampling. So um, the algorithm randomly picks up pairs of nodes and then calcu calculates and estimates between the centrality for large graphs. Um, and in network X, this, this functionality is implemented. You can either compute precisely uh, between the centrality or you can approximate it, right? So tip, again, usually on large graphs, you approximate it simply because just you know, too many computations. 
All right, any questions about this centrality? Okay, so now we, we started three types of centralities. There is a degree centrality, there is a, um, where is it? So there, so there is a degree centrality, um, then there is a closing centrality, which is a geometric central, centrality, like literally physically center of the graph. And then there is a between the centrality, which tells us um, about the shortest path, how many shortest paths go through the node, right? So these are three major, major centralities. Now, um, if you start thinking again about the importance now of, of, of a person or of, of a node in the network, uh, in social network, you can think about, of course, you know, importance as, as being proportional to the number of direct friends, right? But there is something else in, in there. Um, you know, it's maybe not, um, not necessarily how many people you know, it's really who you know, right? So, um, I don't know, if, if you're friends with a president, right, you probably much more important than if you have you know, 200 students as your friends, right? Well, kind of suspect. So, now, because in, 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 in this scenario, we're not looking into, um, you know, titles, right, or any additional information for the nodes, but you can think about this idea. You are important if you're connected to a node who is also important. So this is sort of reverse, it, it, I mean, it's, it's kind of, you know, loopy definition, right? It's loopy definition in the sense that you're important if you're connected to a person who is important, right? That person is important if he is connected to a person who is important. And so you can kind of iterate and loop this uh, over and over and over and over again, going through the, a lot of people. Now, interestingly enough, surprisingly enough, if this is done kind of carefully, it actually might work. And so the idea is the following. Let's say we assign importance uh, to the node as a linear combination, as a sum of importances of its neighbors. Um, now here I, I put the, I put here the matrix, right? And if you think about, let's say, if it's again, if it's just a binary matrix, it's just a sum and it's summation of the neighbors. And if it is, uh, you know, non-binary matrix, well, maybe it, it, it carries the the weight, um, and the weight might be the intensity of communications. Um, so then it, that's taken into account. But overall, the idea is that the importance of the node is given as a sum of the importance of the neighbors, right? So the importance of this node will be calculated as a sum of the importances of its neighbors, right? And in turn, the importance of, say, this node will be computed at the sum of importances of its neighbors and so on and so forth. Make sense? Okay. Now, the problem is that if we just take this definition and do what I say, which is, okay, we calculate the sum and then we, you know, put it, plug it back in and calculate it again and calculate it again and calculate it again. So do it exactly the way I've been drawing here on the picture. Guess what's going to be happening? Let's say we start with everybody assigning to everyone importance equal to one. If we start running these iterations, what's going to be happening? Everyone is going to have the same importance? At, at the beginning, yes, but then, you know, different number of people, uh, you know, different nodes have different number of connections, right? And so if this node has, for example, only three connections, on the next iteration, the importance of this node will be three. And this node has one, two, three, four, five, six connections. The importance of this guy will be six, right? Uh, so each will be getting different importance. But if I keep iterating, what's gonna be happening with this importances?
they'll just they'll just keep growing. Because, yeah, they're gonna sum up. Yeah, you 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 will keep sum up because next time you know the importance of this guy is six. Then I calculate the importance of this guy, for example. It you know it would be this importance is one, this importance is six. Let's say you know whatever importance here, it's already seven, right? Then I recalculate the importance of this guy. Uh, all of a sudden, now it's seven plus one plus importance of this. This it's not six anymore. It's going to be let's say thirteen, and so on and so forth, right? So it's going to be growing, and um, you know the more you iterate, the, the more it grows. So it's useless. It's not a metric. It's not going to converge to anything. But interestingly enough, that if on every iteration after we add up those numbers, you, we divide it by some constant carefully selected constant, right? We divide it, we normalize by it. Then, and then we calculate this number, we plug it back. Then, surprisingly, after very many iterations, those importance values will stop changing. They will saturate to some numbers and stay that way. And that magic number is called eigenvalue. Um, how many of you remember what eigenvalue second vectors are? Vaguely. Vaguely. Oh, come on. Linear algebra. Substantive значение, substantive vectora. Okay. So if you have a if you have this type of equation where A is a matrix and V is a vector, then there is an equation in this form. That for every that for every matrix for every symmetric matrix, I'm sorry, for every symmetric matrix, you can find out the vectors and the numbers such that when you take and multiply this matrix by the vector, it's gonna be the same as take the same that taking that vector and multiplying by a number, okay? Those called eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And so what I'm saying is um, the problem I just described is actually the problem for finding eigenvalues and eigenvectors where A is a adjacency matrix uh, of this graph, okay? And so the way this metric eigenvector centrality works is the following. We actually solving eigenvalue eigenvector problem and we select the first eigenvector and every element in that eigenvector is gonna be the score um, the eigenvector centrality score for the node. All right, I pause here for a sec. Does this make some sense? All right, come on, guys. Say yes, no, so, so. To me, but I lost some parts, so. Okay, well, you know, the, the parts of, of what? Of why it is eigenvectors or? Um, no, like my internet kind of stopped oh. working for some seconds, so I got stuck at the point in which we were like um, reflecting about the, um, the fact that you're gonna infinitively iterate over the same problem. Okay, yeah, so just a quick recap. So if we just iterate, yes. keep summing up things, then um, the numbers, the values will just grow and we want to prevent that from happening. And so what we're gonna do on every iteration, we're gonna normalize it by dividing the sum by some fixed number, by some constant. And this magic constant, the, the right constant, actually comes from the eigenvalue equation, right? Because this, um, what we're trying to do is literally solve this eigenvalue eigenvector problem where A is adjacent matrix and B is a vector of the scores. And, uh, we don't really need to do what I just described manually instead of actually doing those iterations and substituting back and you know recalculating, we can actually just solve eigenvalue, eigenvector problem. Uh, there are solvers to do it. And after we solve it, we pick up um, the, the largest, so we pick up the eigenvector that corresponds to the largest eigenvalue. Um, and the elements of that eigenvector will be the scores that corresponds to centrality of every node, okay? And so that the logic how we got there. All right, guys, okay. So this is actually quite powerful metric um, of, of centrality. 
Now, let's take a look um, at, at a few examples. So if I have this, this funny graph, um, you know, the, the, the closeness centrality is, is shown, you know, shown on this picture, right? Um, it's sort of the one that, that gives us, you know, in some sense, the nodes are positioned within the, within, within the centers of the clusters, right? Those are the nodes that has largest closeness centrality because they're close enough they're close to a lot of nodes, right? I mean, degree centrality is, is sort of obvious, which is the largest. Now, which nodes will have the largest between the centrality here? Those between clusters? Yeah. So I, you know, the, 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 the good, sort of the good guess would be something those nodes that are that are bridges right so this is a bridge you know i'll guess this one this one maybe some some nodes here right something that is a bridge something that connects clusters right so let's take a look um yeah so these are the nodes um for this graph that has largest between the centrality right so these are the nodes that connect uh, large groups of nodes um, that act as a bridge. Now, if I think about eigenvector centrality, that is something interesting because with eigenvector centrality, it's, um, you know, it's, it's very hard to say which will have high eigenvector centrality, but it's important to remember that in eigenvector centrality, when we compute it, um, the centrality of the node depends on centrality of its neighbors, right? And so, if you have nodes with high eigenvector centrality, they usually will be next to each other. They usually will, become, will come as, as a group because it's the most important node and then the other nodes kind of getting importance from that node, right? And the importance of this node is enhanced by, uh, by importance of, of its neighbors, right? So, um, so um, this is the group that has the highest eigenvector centrality in, in, in this graph. So as expected, I mean, it would, it, it would be very hard to guess where in, in the graph it will be, but as expected, the nodes are uh, connected, right? The nodes that have higher uh, eigenvector centrality, they're all connected. Okay, here's another example. This is a graph just, um, you know, it's, it's called planar graph. Um, there is no intersection here um, of, of, the, of the edges, right? The way it's designed, it's randomly scattered nodes, and then they're connected such a way that edges do not intersect. Uh, I mean, it should not actually, I don't know, maybe they do somewhere, but they shouldn't. Uh, and, uh, What's color coded are different types of centralities. So um, red is a high value, uh, blue is a low value. So if you notice at the graph, if we look at the, at, at the graph here um, on the left, um, there are, you know, it's actually again, degree centrality is, is kind of hard to see here. Uh, it's number of direct neighbors, but there are some nodes here that you can see they have like lots of direct connections and so they have high degree and there are nodes here that have you know degree one or two uh, they're the lowest degree okay now b is a closeness centrality it's this geometric centrality and uh you know sort of as expected um nodes with high geometric centrality they are somewhere you know in the center right which is actually good that it, 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 it works, right? So here is a high centrality, geometric centrality, and low geometric centrality here, sort of on the periphery, right? All these guys. Now, between the centrality, this is also interesting. Remember, between the centrality, these are the nodes um, that are bridges. And if you notice, it's very clear here, these guys are playing this sort of role of bridges, right? And they are red here, so they have high, uh, between the centrality. And finally, like in vector centrality, again, it's hard to say where it's going to be, but when you get 
eigenvector centrality, you will get a group of nodes that are connected at high eigenvector centrality. Okay? So, bottom line, when you talk about centrality metrics, um, each, there, there are multiple metrics, right? We just described, discussed four of the metrics. In fact, if you go and look into the literature, there are probably, I don't know, 20, 50, maybe even 100 met. I mean, there are people coming up with those metrics every day, right? And the idea is that every metric measures something slightly different. These are like sort of the most fundamental basic metrics um, that everybody knows, everybody kind of, you know, tried. And they're probably like this sort of, I would call it like workhorses of, of uh, when, when you want to measure um, the, the centrality of the node um, on, on some graph, right? So that's what we usually um, use. It's easy to compute. And, um, you know, each of them, each of this metric is easily interpreted and the interpretation is slightly different, right? Depending on the problem you're trying to solve, you might use one metric or another metric. Um, last thing about those, these metrics um, is that when you have a graph, we can actually also talk about the measure for the entire graph. And the measure is called centralization. And this measure really measures how the most central node in the network, how, it is, how central it is compared to other nodes. So what I'm trying to say is the following. Here with the centralization, we really want to, uh, we use it to differentiate different types of networks, right? It's not about nodes anymore, it's about networks. And so uh, what we want to be able to distinguish is, you know, this type of network, the star network versus you know, this type of network, right? As, as I said at the beginning, um, in the star network, there is a very large difference in between centrality of the central node and centralities of all other nodes, right? In the network on the right, in the circular network, centralities of all the nodes approximately the same. And so this network is very centralized. This network has a very low centralization. And the metric here, the centrality, the, the metric, the centralization network measure, measures the difference in between this network type and this one. And the way it does it, it calculates the difference in between centrality of the most central node minus centralities of all other nodes. And so if we are in a scenario like here, like, like this one, the centralization will be zero. Now, the normalization here makes it such a way that the centralization for the network like a star will be equal to one. So this centralization here is one, centralization there is zero, and any other network that we have that will have a structure sort of not as centralized as a star, but also not as sort of equal as a circle will have a centralization measure in between zero and one, okay? So previously we talked about four, or four metrics for each node centrality. Here, this one is a measure of, of centralization, how you know, centralize the structure of the network. Here we're comparing networks. Make sense? Any questions here? Okay. Okay. Now we're going to switch to um, directed graphs and switch to uh, what we call also, um, you know, link, uh, you know, link structure uh, of the network. So when we have a directed graph, um, you know, the well, sort of geometrically, the difference is now every edge has a direction, right? Um, so we distinguish in this case sender and receiver, and in more, in many uh, uh, you know in many scenarios, live scenarios that is kind of natural. 
we do have, for example, network of um, you know friendship, let's say, or your acquaintances that you have in your phone book. But then when we talk about phone calls, there's always somebody calling somebody, right? So there's a direction. Yeah, you have a discussion, but then there is a direction in the call, right? Emails, they're always, though there is a connection, like again, friendship and acquaintances connection um, that does have directions, but uh, email goes, it is directed, right? Somebody says to somebody. In fact, um, if you think about social networks, um, there are a lot of ways, there are directionalities in there, right? There is, of course, likes when somebody likes somebody else. There's also messages which are directed. There are even friendship can have a direction because there's always one person that sort of ask for friendship, another person, right? So it is also can be a directed relationship. Um, so, so directed graphs are everywhere. In, so, in some sense, if you think about it, um, there are more directed graphs out there in practice than, than un undirected, right? Um, we can actually try to use the same centrality measure for directed graphs as we did for undirected. And some of those measures work easily well, right? For example, the degree centrality, degree centrality is really no problem. Um, you can just, you can calculate degree centrality. Uh, you can have to just, instead of one degree centrality, you would have like two of those. One will be, for example, out degree centrality. So how many, let's say, outgoing calls you make. And the other one can be how many you know, incoming calls you get, right? So it can be like in degree centrality and out degree centrality. And it can be very, very, they could be very, very different, right? Um, for example, uh, I don't know, if you're a popular person, probably friendship requests, you'll get many more friendship requests than you'll be sending out. Or if, um, I don't know, it, it's uh, the network of uh, web pages, websites, then the number of pages referring to, pointing to, say, CNN web page by far exceeds the number of network or the sites that CNN points to from their page, right? So those can be very, very different. And that's, you know, that's not a problem. So degree centrality works well uh, for directed graph. You can have degree centrality, you can have normalized degree centrality, no problem. Now, things getting a little bit more complicated when we start talking about closeness centrality and betweenness centrality. And the reason is the following. Uh, both closeness, closeness centrality and betweenness centrality, usually use, they're using distance as a metric, right? And um, the moment you kind of introduce distance and, direct, and directionality, you run into this type of scenarios. So when you have a one-way street, right, uh, it's only one step if you go from here to here, right? This is one, this is two. But if you go from one to two, it is three steps. Right. So this way it is one step away. This way it is three steps away. So all of a sudden it becomes much more confusing um, how you actually measure, uh, you know, closeness centrality um, for a node, because then the question is, okay, are you measuring it from the node to other nodes or are you measuring from other nodes to this node? Right. So all of a sudden those can be very different. Um, that's one point. The other point, if we start measuring between the centrality, then again, due to this one-way streets situation, um, the answer can be very, very different in misleading, right? And especially, I don't know, if you drive in Moscow and especially in, in, within the garden ring, um, and there are a lot of one-way streets now, uh, you can realize that getting from this point to this point can take you, you know, one minute in one way, and it will, might take hours in traffic jam if you go sort of in the opposite direction, try to get in the opposite direction. Um, and that's why um, closeness centrality and betweenness centrality, they're used in directed networks, 
but they're not used um, a lot or they, you, you need to use them carefully. There are a lot of papers written on how to actually you know, take direct directionality into account, um, how to make it work. It is possible. You know, the simplest way is to just take a directed network and make it undirected by dropping the directions and then you know, use the closeness and dependence centrality on that. But there are other sort of smarter way how to take directionality into account, okay? Now, what we're gonna talk about is slightly different story now. We're gonna talk about um, you know, page rank. So page rank um, is really uh, you know, in a method, an algorithm that has been introduced to measure, to rank the web pages, right? Um, the, the, the pages on the graph and back in the days when the web was just created and the search engine just sort of starting appearing, there were a lot of problems in providing relevant results and ranking them, sorting them by importance. Um, there are a lot of spammers who would actually spam um, your, your spam the results and especially it became a real problem when uh, um, when online advertising kind of start flourishing and it became very profitable to be on the top of the search results because then you can actually just make lots and lots of money. So, um, and then the search engines start trying, start, started fighting with this, coming up with algorithms that actually would put only relevant pages on the top of the search results. And, uh, you know, there is of course, you know, the biggest effort was on text analysis and the freshness of the pages. But then there was this idea of using hyperlinks or links in between pages as a factor. And it actually worked remarkably well. And that's the algorithm which, is, which was invented by uh, Google founders, right? By, uh, by, by Breen and Page, right? Uh, and by the way, still nobody kind of knows if it's PageRank because it's, it's created by, by, by the guy whose last name is Page or they were talking about pages. And so it's a ranking of pages, right, on the web. Uh, you know, people, people say different things. But anyway, the idea of this algorithm was, you know, written and the patent was issued by uh, for Sergey Brin and uh, Larry Page. Um, and so the algorithm became, you know, page rank, known as page rank. So the idea is the following. Um, really, the, the hyperlink or the link from a page to another page is your endorsement of that page. I mean, you don't link um, to, a, to a sort of to garbage, right? You usually, from your site, when you build your site, um, you, you connect uh, not to a random page, you connect to a page um, you believe is important. In some sense, you know, it's also true for social networks, you most likely will not gonna connect to some random person. In some sense, uh, connecting to somebody is endorses him, right? Because, you know, you want him to be a friend. So you kind of put some trust on this person, you endorse him. And so web graph in this sense is a graph of endorsements where pages connected to another pages. And, uh, 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 you know, sometimes this, it's reci reciprocal, um, you know, one page connected to this page, that page connected back, sometimes it's not, right? And social network is usually always reciprocal. So the idea then would be to actually use the number of incoming edges, right, incoming links as a ranking for your page. And the more incoming links you have, um, the higher the rank will be. But that brings another challenge. You actually, the rank should not only depend on the number of incoming pages. It's important to have this sort of self-fulfilling prophecy that it's, it's important who points to you, right? Because if it is an important page points to you, it's good. If it is an unimportant page, yeah, maybe who cares? And in this case, importance is a number of links. So what I'm trying to say is this, um, we want to not only to measure the number of pages, um, I'm sorry, number of edges, number of links that come into the page, but also want to take into account um, the number of edges that would come into the guys who points to you, 
right? So that's sort of the idea. Very similar to what we discussed uh, a couple of minutes ago when we talked about eigenreactive centrality. Now, um, surprisingly enough, this idea can be can be thought of um, as a result of the following process. Imagine uh, what's called a web surfer, right? And so the, and the guys actually, this is a quotation from their page, uh, from their paper, from brain and page paper. So what they're saying is that we're gonna model a user behavior on the web. And we assume that there is a random surfer who kind of walks randomly on the graph. So he clicks on the page, you know, looks at the page, picks up randomly one of the outgoing links and follows that link. Then look at the page he reaches, you know, find another link, randomly select out of the available links to follow, clicks and follow. And I'm sure you've done that also, right? Browsing the, the, the web. Um, in fact, with social networks, I'm sure you actually clicked on your friends and then you saw somebody in your friend's list and you click on that person and then you then you see somebody in that person friend list and you might click on that one and then you look at some guy or girl and you're like, who the heck is here? And you, you forgot that you actually got there by randomly kind of following the friendship network. So, and that's the idea that, that Brilliant Page introduced and uh, how, where, where's the ranking here? Well, the idea is the following. If you keep doing this for a long time, eventually, and if you do it for a very, very long time, eventually you will be visiting some pages more often than others. Think about the following thought experiment. You're in a city um, and you know, let's say, let's take old city, right? Let's take old, maybe even small city. So it's not, it's, it's easy to imagine. Um, I don't know, let's take Vilnius, for example, or one of those European cities where they have squares and they have a lot of streets coming to the squares. Right, uh, they, the streets intersect on the squares, and the experiment you do is you just you know start walking on the city, coming to a square, and then randomly picking up the street you follow, and just walk. Yeah, you get to the next intersection, another square, you randomly pick up the street you're gonna walk on and just walk on it, right? And so you just keep doing it, do it all day long, and what you'll notice that surprisingly there is and if especially if it's a small you know small small town small city there are some places you will be seeing more often than others right um some sort of squares some intersections will be much more popular in your route will appear much more often than others and then what you do is you just take and rank them by how often they appeared or how often you visited them during the day the rank you're gonna get is called page rank. Okay, so that's pretty much it. It's the ranking that comes up as a result of a random walk on a graph. I'm gonna pause here for a second. Does this make sense or do you have any questions or you guys look puzzled and confused? Or it's obvious. Come on, say something people. Kind of makes sense. Kind of makes sense. Good. All right. So the best part of the story is that uh, you know Brian Page wrote this paper, published it, patented algorithms, and went on building uh, you know Google without actually even realizing that what they described is a random walk and it's a mark of chain process and there is a very strict mathematical properties that makes it successful, right? So it's actually works not by miracle, but there are very, very uh, well-defined mathematical theorems that proves that this type of process converges and you can actually get that ranking as a result of this process. So now there is some mathematics, I'm not gonna go deep into that. I'll just kind of explain to you a little bit hand-waving and just sort of showing you um, what's where, uh, but the idea is the following. If you have this type of a graph and you can walk on this graph, um, the probability, just a sec, 
uh, I want to be drawing the probability to end up on the node I at the time step T plus one is calculated as a sum of probabilities of being on its neighbors at the previous time moment divided by the number of options to walk from them. Let me explain. So the probability to be on this node at time t plus one is calculated the following way. You can get to this node from node two, from node one, and from node four, right? So from node two, there are actually two ways you can go. You can go here or you can go there. So the probability to end up on this node, starting from node two, is the probability of being on node two times one half because there are two ways to go from this node, right? So if you are on this node, the probability to end up here is one half. So the total probability here is the probability of being there on, on, on this node at previous moment of time and going to the right. Now, then you can be on the node number four. There are also two ways. So if you're on the node number four, there is probability one half to be to end up on the node three on the next step. Again, if there are two ways, um, so there is, then what we do is the probability of being in node four times one half. Finally, if you node one, you actually have one way, two ways, three, four, five, six ways. So if you node one, there is one six probability of going to node three. One so, fifth. Uh, one, fifth, one fifth, right? One. Yeah, because we cannot go from six to three. Oh, wait a minute. One, two, three, four, five. There are six ways, right? So if you're here, there is this way you can go, this way you can go, this way, this yeah, way. Yeah, but if we go from one to six, from node one to node six, we won't be able to come to node three because there are no ways from uh, node six to node three. That is absolutely correct. What I'm saying is um, there is a probability of one six to go, because you can take six ways, right? Six routes from node one. And only one of those routes leads to node three in a direct step, in one step. Right? Oh, I see, now I got it, sorry. Uh -huh. Okay, good. So it's one, it's one six because there are six ways to go and it's only one that, that goes directly here. So totally the probability of to be on this node three at time t plus one is equal to three options, comes from three options. On the previous step, be here and have a step and take this step, be here and take this step, be here and take this step. So what you do, you add up those probabilities multiplied by one half, one half, and one six. And that's what's written here. Okay. And that's the essence of page rank equation. And then you do some math here and uh, surprisingly, well, Surprisingly, it leads also to eigenvalue eigenvector type of equation, the same type of equation as we saw uh, when we talked about centrality metrics. But there is one exception, and that's an important thing. Um, since the graph is uh, directed, the rest situation, and uh, I, you know, there's this this picture does not, I think, does not have this situation. Yeah, it does not have it. But there are situations possible in these graphs, uh, situations like this, for example. Imagine this type of graph. Okay. So what's going to be happening in this type of graph, if you start walking on this graph, you know, you, you, you start, start walking on this graph. If you walk here, and get on this node, you're stuck there. There is no way out, okay? So it's sort of one way street with a dead end, all right? And you cannot go back. And that's a, that's a problem because uh, the, the, run, the Markov model and the random walk is, assumes that walk never ends, right? It's always ongoing. And so, uh, 
Brilliant Page proposed a solution to this problem by saying, look, if you ever get in this situation, then you randomly jump to any other node. Okay? And so if there is one, two, three nodes available, then the probability of each of this jump is one third. So the way they kind of explain this, motivated this, is that imagine that you kind of do this web surfing, you go to the web page, you follow the link, you go to the web page, you follow the link, finally you get to a page that doesn't have any links showing out, going, letting you go out of it, right? What do you do? Yeah, you, know, you probably type in a new URL or make a new search and start over again, right? Because there is no way you can go. And so you end up another page. And so that's what they proposed. And mathematically, this really means uh, taking our, um, you know, walk and the way it's described, plus adding an option to jump to any other place in the graph. And that jump to any other place is called teleportation. Well, because it's, you know, if you think about like walking into the city, it's teleportation. You can actually, if you come to the dead, dead end in a, in a city, you kind of teleport yourself to any other place in the city you want. Yeah, it works in the game probably, that it doesn't work that well in real life, but uh, this is the idea. And so what they're saying is our, uh, our walk will consist of sort of step after step real walk. And one of, once in a while, um, you go, we're going to teleport. And there is a coefficient of teleportation, they call it alpha, that kind of tells you, uh, okay, how often you do this teleportation. And that's the only parameter that that algorithm has. Okay. So that's your page rank. Um, well, let's see how it works. So if you take a directed graph and you run page rank algorithm on it, what I'm showing here is uh, every node is sized according to the page rank that the node gets, right? And so if you notice, it actually gives a high you know, degrees, high value of the page rank to the nodes that are well connected. Of course, there's nodes that are connected to each other, right? Um, and there is, you know, a bit more consistency in this than uh, in, in just sort of degree ranking. So that's your page rank. And based on this algorithm, people created tons of other algorithms based on this idea. There is like, you know, book rank, there is a tweet rank, there is site rank, there is fact rank, there is a Diffusion rank, social rank, image rank, chemical rank, road rank, uh, paper rank, whatever rank, right? So anything that you can think of about as a graph where nodes are some entities and then there is a directed relationship in between them, right? So one entity points to another. You can actually rank them. And uh, rank based on, on, on the directionality of those edges. And for example, when you have yeah, no, tweets, there are retweets. When you have papers, there is a citation for the papers, um, you know, where, where you have, I don't know, I have actually no clue what chemical rank is. Uh, there are sports rank, there are teams, and they play with each other, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a way to rank um, entities when they're connected by directed relationships, okay? And that's a page rank. Any questions here? How do you, ex uh, do you assign the probability to be in a page to begin with? Oh, you do not assign probability being in a page. What you do is you actually run this algorithm again. I, I'm sorry, guys, I, I forgot to mention, right? So um, if, if you, uh, you know, the way I showed here is this um, iterative, you know, iterative process where you, you assign some probabilities and then you iterate, right? Now, of course, you can just assign equal probabilities to all the pages and then just start iterating. But the good news, if you take this equation 
and you write it in the following form, you realize that this is uh, this can be solved as a linear system or eigenvalue eigenvector problem. And so you don't really need to start with any probability. You can just get a closed form solution. And so when you run the page rank algorithm, you know, in, in say um, network X, it will ask you for adjacency matrix that you will give it. It will ask you for this teleportation coefficient that will tell you how much sort of random jumps to add. And then it will just return to you the vector of probabilities um, for, for every node to be on any node. Okay. Thank you. All right. And the very last algorithm I want to point out is kind of interesting algorithm. At some moment, it was competing against PageRank. It lost because PageRank happened to scale really well, which means for a large, very large graph, it still works very, very well. This algorithm does not work well for large graphs, but it is actually a very interesting algorithm, and it is very useful uh, for some type of applications. And the idea is the following. When we look at the, um, let's say, and I, I'll just give you an example, but it's of course applied uh, in many different scenarios. So the idea is the following. Imagine that you have a citation, you have you know, research papers, and those research papers, um, they, well, on one hand, um, they provide, quite often provide some review of the field, and they also provide some you know, original content. And then papers cite other papers, right? And so the papers that are review papers um, usually cite a lot of original research papers because that's what the point of review, right? And original research papers, you know, often cited, if it's a good paper, a good research paper, they are cited by multiple reviews. And so the idea is to every paper to assign two scores. One score is called authority score or um, the score that sort of tells you about the originality of the content, right? So how authoritative it is, right? So it's sort of original research paper. Another score, the second score is called usually hubs or hub score. Um, it tells you, you know, how big of a hub, sort of how good of a hub, how good of a uh, review this is, right? And so the idea is that, you know, good authorities so good original papers are referred by good reviews. And the good uh, reviews point to good original papers. So every paper gets two scores. And those scores are computed based on, uh, you know, the incoming versus outgoing links. All right, so two scores, and you know, scores have slightly different meaning. So then you can say, okay, uh, in, in the same way, in the same fashion as we previously done uh, when we talked about eigenvalues, eigenvectors, you can say, okay, uh, let's let's assign this. So we call it score A and, and and score H, authoritative authority and hubs, and let's say the authoritativeness of the paper is calculated through the value of the hubness of its neighbors. And the value of a hubness depends on the value of authorities of the papers it points to, right? Again, it's sort of self loop, right? But here it's a self loop with two type of, of metrics, right? Um, it's the level of authoritativeness and the level of hubness. And by the way, this algorithm is called HITS. It was introduced by John Kleinberg uh, back at IBM, back in the day. So if we do that, if we do that, um, then again, you can kind of combine those scores and create a system of linear, relation, of, of linear equations, two equations now instead of one equation. And that will become an eigenvalue problem and you again solve it. Um, and instead of one score, you get two scores. The reason you get two scores is because it's left and right eigenvalues of a matrix 
or in other words, uh, we calculate eigenvalues of uh, matrix A transpose A and A A transpose. Okay. So that's sort of the idea, right? Instead of calculating eigenvalues of, of matrix A, we do it A transpose A or A A transpose. And that's your uh, authority score and hub score. Now, it sounds like why would you want to do this? This is kind of weird. Um, it actually works quite nice if the graph is not large, right? It breaks down on very large graphs, but if the graph is probably up to like 1,000 nodes, this works quite well. And so here's an example of this done on a very small graph, but still kind of nice. So this is a directed graph and um, I scale the nodes by their you know, degree of this hub score or hubness on the left and authoritativeness on the right. And if you notice the idea is again, so hubs are those that are usually point to something and that's who have large hub scores. But it's always that large hub score, large hub, good hub should point to good authorities. And so what you see here is that this is a good hub and yes, it points to a lot of good authorities. And this hub has also some authority score, but quite small, but very large hub score and points to good authorities. Um, uh, but at the same time, for example, um, here, um, this the authoritativeness of these guys is very low and the hubness score here is very low. You cannot, you, you can barely see it, right? So there is this connection. On the one hand, first of all, hubs, there are those nodes that are well connected, but they also should point out to good author authority scores. Now, I, I have been explaining this in terms of like good, bad reviews. Uh, what's important to keep in, keep in mind that there is no content here. I'm not, we're not analyzing text or we're not analyzing, you know, sort of any content. It's all done on the based on the connectivity pattern. So you can even, you can take social network and think about, you know, two different properties for people um, that one that will sort of enforce another right and then you can also run this type of calculations okay and so these are called hubs authorities um, and um, again network x does have a built-in function for doing this so you really don't need to do anything yourself finally coming back to um the florentines families right the one that we started that we started this lecture with um, well, the, the researchers actually run, uh, you know, this is a network, right? This is the network we looked at. And, um, you know, guys ran a lot of different centrality metrics. So between the centrality, you know, Medici has the largest value. <laughs> Closest centrality, Medici has the largest value. Eigenvector centrality, Medici has the largest value. Page rank centrality, Medici has the largest value. Okay degree centrality, you know, the largest value. And there are like, again, as I mentioned, there are like multiple other sort of centralities um, that, that, that are important here. Medici is not the largest, but well, well. So, um, and the hypothesis that, look, Medici strategically positions themselves in um, this sort of interfamily inter marriages and that's why they survived, right? The name survived and sort of the, the sort of the, the, the proof, right? I mean, sort of the proof from network theory is that look, um, whatever metric we take in terms of the importance of the family in the network, um, you know, they pretty much everywhere on the top of it, right? But this is sort of, you know, this is curiosity. This is of course not, not kind of very scientific, but it does show that with this type of approach, you can actually make some sort of interesting, interesting and ex discoveries and interesting unexpected applications. All right, a uh, bunch of references. Again, if you look at this, uh, some of them quite old, right? And the metrics 
um, that that the, the centrality, like the, the degree centrality between the centrality, um, you know, and, and, and geometric closeness centrality, they go back to like fifties. Um, and you know, here's a here here's a link to uh, you know older papers, um, and and seventies. Um, but then um, the paper is on the page rank. Um, this is around 2000. That's when um, you know people start looking into in, in, into page ranks. And then there were like several reviews. You know, there is a review 2004, and then there is a big review of 2014 page rank beyond the web. If you're interested in application of page rank and actually learning more about theory, how to compute it, um, take a look at, at the last review. All right. Any questions? Okay. Good. Well, if no questions, then uh, we'll stop here, and uh, we are actually we're already out of time. So you probably.